So welcome everyone. This is Solar 101 as part of Center for an Ecology-Based Economy's sixth annual Solar and EV Expo as part of National Drive Electric Week. If you're new to CB, our mission here is to engage the community in developing practical ecological solutions in the areas of food, shelter, energy, and transportation. The goal today is to get you all up to speed on everything you need to know about getting energy from the sunshine. Before we get going, we just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that scattered around here, we are all on land once nurtured by the Wabanaki people, here specifically the Arosaguntacook, who for millennia lived in cooperation with this now shattered ecosystem, who are still fighting for their sovereignty today and to whom we owe an unfathomable debt. We're hoping to see you at other Solar and EV Expo events this week, including tomorrow night's panel with Mike Dunn on community solar and Thursday night's panel also at seven o'clock calling 2030, a vision for electric mobility in Western Maine. And if you happen to miss last night's EV 101, you can catch the recording on our website or on our Facebook page. Um, and I, I'll, after I stop talking, I'll put a link in the chat if you want to register for those other upcoming events. Um, and we have more of our ride along virtual test drive videos uh, we're releasing online throughout the week as well. Um, if you're new to Zoom, uh, please keep yourself muted during the presentation. If you don't want to be part of the recording, you can turn your video camera off. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, we are recording it, so I'll send out the recording afterwards, or if you just want to watch it again and take more notes, um, you'll have that opportunity. We want to thank our event sponsors for the week. We have Paris Auto Barn, Lee Auto Malls, Revision Energy, Garbo Kane Integrated Solar Builders, Power Market, Next Amp, Seacoast E-Bikes, and Plug in America, all generously chipped in to help make this happen. And additionally, we're having a raffle. So each time you show up for one of our webinars, your name goes in the raffle. We have some gift cards to our local area businesses, and we'll be putting that out in the newsletter next week um, for you lucky winners. So stay tuned for that. I'll also put a link in the chat if you want to subscribe to our newsletter if you don't already get that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Don and Fred, and they will introduce themselves and take it away. Okay. Well, your screen probably says I'm Fred Garbo, but I'm actually Don McLean. Fred's over here. We'll speak to you later. Um, we are part of the CB Energy Working Group. And I'm going to share my screen with you, or this one. I think we are. Go down to share. You got it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. I'm hoping everybody can see that. Looks good. Okay. Heads are nodding. Very good. All right. So we're, we're a group of, of people that are interested in, in energy, where it comes from, how it's used, uh, its effects upon us and the world around us. Um, so we get together at you know, meetings uh, every other week or so, and we have quite a bit of fun while we're doing it, talking about energy. So the introduction to energy is what's a watt? We're going to have to yep. click this one. Right. So this one here. Next one. No, the next. That you got next one. Yep. On there. No, it didn't work. Oh. Oh, here. Oh, over here. There we go. There, there we go. You got it. You guys see what's a what now? Thumbs up. Okay. Looks good. The power of knowledge. Uh, so I'm a long time renewable energy enthusiast and I've lived off the grid for about a quarter of a century. Um, it's important to understand power so we can be empowered. The more we rely on ourselves for what we need, the less power others have over us. So what's a watt? It's a unit of power equal to, oh, come on, I have to do it this way, I'm learning. Um, one volt times one amp, and uh, one watt hour is is one watt for an hour. So we usually buy our electricity in kilowatt hours. So that would be a thousand watts uh, for an hour. Just a little bit of preview there. So that when you uh, the energy released in four kitchen matches is about the 
equal to the energy of one watt hour to give you some some kind of reference. So here we are. Um, get to the right one. So when they are burned, it releases about one watt of power. Thousand watts equals a kilowatt. Um, a kilowatt costs um, here about 15 cents. So let's see. An adult can uh, generate about 100 watts when using a pedal generator on a bicycle. That's about how much energy muscular effort can turn into electricity. Um, really strong athletes can, can peak out at about 500 watts. These Italian bicyclists that you see during the Tour de France, they can do about half horsepower for a fairly extended period of time. But I'm not that guy, so I can do 100 watts for a while. So working fairly hard on this pedal generator for 10 hours equals the electricity of one kilowatt hour. Therefore, um, because of the amount of, of energy that's in a gallon of gasoline, um, working hard, a person can produce that energy equivalent in about 30 days. So even at $100 a gallon, uh, gasoline is, would be a very good deal. Um, that, however, the negative consequences of burning fossil fuels is very poor. Climate change, toxic emissions, social instability, um, you know, how did our oil get under their sand? That sort of consequence. So let's go next. The power of sunshine reaching the earth on a clear day is about one kilowatt per square meter. So one kilowatt hour um, per meter squared. And here in Maine, we have an average of just about four hours of what's called insulation, the, the amount of sun that hits a surface of the earth. So, um, and solar panels can harvest about 20% of that. So. Each meter of, of sunshine can deliver about 200 watts. So, and the average um, sunshine per day is a little bit less than one kilowatt hour per day. Um, so the average main household electricity use is 19 kilowatt hours a day, um, call it around 20. And that means at least 20 meters squared of solar panels, pretty close to 200 square feet, can provide enough electricity for your average main household, just to give you an idea of how much space that takes up. So, um, of course, there are other ways to harvest um, stored solar energy. That's my, my wood stove. And um, we're speaking mostly about electricity today, but I want to mention that uh, there are other forms as well. Uh, the wood stove heats our house, but it also um, cooks our food and makes hot water. That's what that pipe um, running up the, the stove pipe is. There's a tank up above in a cupola that stores hot water. So we get a lot of um, benefit from burning the wood, which is really stored solar energy. And, but when it's, uh, when it's too hot outside for the wood stove, we have flat plate collectors on the roof, which uh, replace that. So without adding any electricity, the, the water just moves around by thermal siphon. Here's a, a ne another example of the direct power of the sun. These uh, eggs are being cooked on a bright day in February. And that's 325 degrees in there. And this is February. So solar ovens are pretty a nifty little device to um, help cut down on your needs for other. Oops, there you go. Sorry. This is a solar array. It's about 600 feet squared. And it uh, demonstrates multiple uses from a recent spill of solar energy. Uh, the clothes you see in the middle there, they were washed and dried using solar electricity. The food was cooked in the solar oven on the left and electricity was pushed back into the grid. 
and the car was charged. Uh, this car, it's a 2015 Nissan Leaf. It can uh, travel one mile using about 210 watt hours. But when it comes to efficiency, size matters. This electric rocket, which is an <laughs> electric bike I built for about $650, goes um, a mile in about 30 watt hours. So, uh, so seven times farther on the same amount of electricity than the car. And however, um, this 40 year old ancient bicycle uh, <laughs> travels without the need for any electricity, but you have to eat more and get in better shape. So, uh, you know, that's, which brings us to my three pillars of renewable energy. The number one thing in my opinion is conservation. Um, saving, or conservation is really the not using of something. And efficiency is using less to do the same thing. When you do the first two very well, then the third one becomes much easier. I used to say that every dollar spent on conservation and efficiency was worth $3 in production of um, photovoltaic arrays. But now th things are so urgent, we need to increase production as fast as possible and do all three at once. And the cost of production has gone down significantly too. So. Sunshine energy is dilute and erratic compared to fossil fuel, as long as you don't factor in like global disturbances and uh, you know, refineries getting blown away by hurricanes and that sort of thing, which for, through our lifetimes, fossil fuels have been very reliable source of energy for us. And at about 33 kilowatt hour per gallon of gasoline, it's no wonder we're addicted to fossil fuels. But we must change to make a sustainable future possible. We've been blessed with easy access to prodigious amounts of energy, and we have become addicted to the power. If we hope to continue to have such a lovely world, we must respect the limits of the systems which provide for us. One part of the solution is solar arrays. And I, with that, I'll introduce Fred, my good friend, who installs lots of arrays. So take it away, Fred. We'll do questions at the end. Oh, yes. No problem. Hi, folks. I'm Fred Garbo. I live here in Norway just about a mile away from Don. We're gonna stop this share for a sec. We're all back. There's Don getting his mask on. Um, hi, Mike Newsom. We've done solar for Mike, done solar for Ted, uh, done solar for myself. Let me try and see if I can get up my presentation. Uh, right there, share. We'll go back to the beginning. Can I have a thumbs up if everybody can see Garbo Kane in its Looks funky shadow letters? Okay, great. And next slide is coming. I went to the Apple store yesterday, and this would be great if all of us could say this. Uh, I'm not sure it was all solar, but uh, the store runs 100% on renewable energy. And I've been trying that just like Don for the last uh, nine years. And my excuse and push towards this was I bought an electric car. And uh, my neighbor said, well, you're running it off dirty fossil fuels. And I agreed with him. So I went to revision and ended up buying one of these solar trackers because I just thought it was cool. Um, and now I think more people are getting into electric cars and getting into solar. Um, I work with Sean. He lives in Otisfield. I live here in Norway. And this is sort of the dog and pony show because I came from a vaudeville background of what we do when we walk into someone's home and talk about the uh, possibilities of solar arrays, like you mentioned. So we got into ones that move because for me, it just made so much more sense is the sun moves, why shouldn't the array move? Uh, but then the next cleave it with all of that is it's expensive. And other people have roofs. Um, so that was one way to go. This is a company out of Vermont that we went over and trained with a couple times. And the fact that it's a dual access solar tracker will become evident as I yak some more about why that is so cool. 
This is the one that uh, we put up at the high school that is sort of a great demonstration of a solar array that moves, so the kids see it move, that charges electric vehicles. Some of the teachers drive electric and hopefully all the teachers will drive electric soon. Uh, it was kind of obvious then that the sun went from uh, the solar panel array and made DC current, came back to AC and came up and fueled your car all in one step. When there were no cars parked there, um, the power went back to the school. Thank you, ZZ, for building such a beautiful sign to try and explain to people why this is the greatest thing going and we should all do it. Right, right. So the deal with me starting in solar was I found solar trackers, but I really didn't know much more about it and went up to Mount Abrams and found out that roof mounts or ground mounts were the way to go. Uh, Nauto, in a way, was putting up 803 panels um, to do solar for Mount Abrams. And I asked if I could help. And I was immediately put on zip tie duty for two weeks in the pouring rain. I survived and uh, <laughs> went on to learning about simple things and, and traveling with these guys. Um, their company's called Solar Market. And this is our very first roof mount. Sean drew it up on his computer. Um, it's over at the Harris's on High Street. Uh, it goes simply in that you do have a roof that faced the south. They already knew that. We went over with a device and checked out the viability of their site. Uh, we put up our scaffolding and put a flash foot under their shingle that is waterproof, a little foot on the bottom. And then the rail was sort of the what the array is going to live on. And you can see in the picture in the lower right hand corner, uh, we've gone around the skylights and then wired it down into their home. Mike, we did this similar system for you. You were like a third or fourth roof mount. These are folks just in our neighborhoods, uh, one in Casco, uh, one in Harrison, and one up just above me at the end of uh, Young's Hill Road. So this is an example of roof mounts and they're fantastic if your roof happens to face this way. And if you have a house that has a roof, you would like to put on an array if your shingles are in good shape because the array is really guaranteed the panel outputs 25 years, 30 years. Sometimes. Um, so if your roof is in bad shape to begin with, we often suggest that you replace it. That was the case uh, with this job we had over in New Hampshire was he was working under the deadline of getting grant money. So we actually put it on and two years later, we came back and took the entire array off. We were freezing and put it back up because he did all new roofing, but he got in under this strange gun of getting money uh, from the New Hampshire system. Really cold install. We've done some big installs. Uh, this is in Concord, New Hampshire on the Grapponi Center. And if you look at how we're doing this, it's a very flat roof that has a membrane. We're wearing knee pads. This is Everett Rideout, who works with the Solar Market, an incredible electrician, lives over in Camden. And with uh, Will Kessler got the job going. And we put panel after panel after panel on this beautiful, incredible membrane, but we did not put a hole in it whatsoever. Uh, so the system is ballasted. If you can see the cinder blocks that hold it down, and if you would notice that the array is unbelievably flat so that the wind wouldn't get underneath these panels. Uh, and so it would only really make solar in the summer, which gets on to other questions about net metering, or in fact that they had such a large roof, we covered the whole roof. So they were making most of their nut, most of their solar kilowatts being sent to the grid in the summer, and they'd get those back October, November, December, as snow started to fall, and then basically give up. Once the array would be covered in December, January, and February, they wouldn't have any production because you really can't make solar through snow. I'm not the tallest guy in the picture. This is over in Freiburg for Stephen King. We went and re did the entire solar array here because it had been done incorrectly and sat dormant for five years. Even though there were panels on the roof, the inverters all popped and nothing happened. So we went and took every single panel off, redid all the rails and all the inverters to fix it. And boy, does that system cook. So we could go from a simple roof mounts. If you have a roof that is facing south, the roof's in good condition. Uh, another way to go is if you have land and property that would be 
convenient for solar. If you would check out how the sun uh, moves across the horizon that way. We did a very big system with these driven pylons and a system called Schletter that was all aluminum with the rails, setting up the parts and pieces and then running the rails, digging a trench. As soon as you get into ground mounts, all of a sudden you're uh, trying to get the electricity and from the inverters in the system to the building and to your panel. So there's a little more involved than a roof mount going through your attic to try and get the electricity off the roof down to where the inverter lives in a utility closet. This product, project finished with that with these three ground mount arrays. Uh, the interesting thing about them is they do not move in any way. So you have to make sure they're high enough. So as snow sheds off them in the winter, it won't be building up enough to start shadowing or shading the bottom row. And there's ways around that with uh, optimizers under the panels or an array on your roof or an array on a tracker that might have shadowing. There's an uh, add-on to panels these days called optimizers. Uh, another way to go with a ground mount is something that the company that builds the trackers just came out with a version of the same materials they use to make their frame to put their array on. I just dropped this on my front lawn. It was my COVID project, so I didn't lose my mind. Is uh, I discovered that my solar that's uh, basically a solar farm a mile from my house on Farmer Rick's property, uh, I couldn't get the federal tax credit of 26% if I didn't have solar on my property, if I then placed a battery on my property, that I couldn't get the tax credit. So I put this eight panel system, here is a view from the back, put an inverter on it. And now when the grid goes down, because my solar was remote up on Rick's Hill there, when the grid would go down, I would get no benefit from that solar because all of it was being sent to the grid. Now, when the grid goes down and it's a sunny day the next day after the storm, I will have solar to actually keep uh, filling the battery so I can be independent. So the interesting thing about this inverter was not in this picture, but it does have a cord to it. And I'm able to charge one of my electric cars, the Nissan Leaf that I bought in 2012 that started this whole thing for me with solar. The inverter actually comes with the charger built into it. And when the sun is shining full tilt, if I plug the car in, it actually gets a solar boost instead of just coming from the grid power or from the solar itself. Uh, it's, it's been tremendous and it's been a really good thing to have another way to do solar. The uh, last possible option before I get on with my yak about trackers, which I like so much, is another company that I've met at trade shows is from Montana. Uh, that's why, I don't know if you can read that on your slide, WWWMT Solar. Montana Solar builds these wonderful adjustable pole mounts. And they do adjust, and the word would be seasonally adjust. Because you can go out in the winter and really uh, set the entire array so that it's at a pretty severe angle so snow would shed off it. And in the summer, you'd run it almost flat as the sun would be so high and tracking across. And then as we get further into the season, you would go out and adjust it. It has a, the ability to adjust it almost like cranking open um, a, a skylight window in your house. And uh, they're unbelievably strong, well-made, and somewhat easy, easy to put up. You just have to put this pipe in. This is at uh, Don's house and Suzanne's down the way. We put in a smaller one with just nine panels. You can see the adjustment comes down. And then we just did five five big bad ones that have 15 panels each that will seasonally adjust at true strength. Each one has its own inverter. And uh, these panels, if you might notice, are somewhat different in that these are bifacial panels in that the sun comes through them and bounces if the ground was white or had white seashells here, or obviously when it snows, they're claiming this LG panel. It's a 400 watt 72 cell panel would also reclaim 30% of a bounce off the snow instead of just getting from the top. This is a new wave in the industry and uh, they aren't all that much more expensive, but for pole mounts and trackers and ground mounts, most everybody has shifted just in the last year to putting in bifacial panels because of that extra boost. Yeah, why would you want a tracker instead? Well, they're cool. They uh, make more electricity because they follow the sun, which is the big red 
zippity doo on the outside there instead of uh, just hanging out on your roof where the sun's only perpendicular once. Dual axis is because they move with tilt and yaw. I'll skip the video. There's many trackers already in Maine. Uh, David Knightley was the first one who he still teaches at Oxford. No, no. I don't either. Mine was the second one, but now there's two that we put up in Pie Tree. Um, we put four up at uh, Wheeler's Insurance on Suzanne's property, your sisters with uh, Bruce, and some of that electricity goes to their home, and then the rest of it's split off for Wheeler's. The one at uh, Fishers, Mike's still there, Mikey Waven. Yeah, he was around for all this. They decided at Thanksgiving, and we had it almost done by Christmas. <laughs> Very cold, cold install. Um, and the horses are around there. This is Tony Giambros at Paris Auto Barn. Uh, in setting this up, I was extremely happy that as it started to track, it missed the eve of his house. <laughs> These are the two at Pie Tree Orchards. And one tracker can run a home, two trackers can run a small business, and four trackers are running a home and a business. They're just phenomenal. They shed snow. You don't put holes in your roof. This is Kenny Poland's up on High Street, uh, the mo one of the most fantastic sites in that there is absolutely nothing blocking this array from first light until the sun sets. I took that picture yesterday. No, I wish I did. That's in Vermont where there's uh, 366 trackers in one huge solar farm. They are more expensive, um, but they certainly get the job done in a whole different way. Yeah, we always end up putting it up in the fall. People finally decide, let's do it now. <laughs> uh, there's a little anemometer up in the corner. I don't know if I have a picture of that. We actually work uh, with uh, electric vehicles to put up our solar, which is probably unusual in the state of Maine. Is uh, There's three different trailers that I haul with uh, the Tesla Model X. It can tow 5,000 pounds, and I haul the tracker there in one trailer. And then we haul all our other gear and the panels usually get delivered to the job site now, which is tremendous. So this is at a wonderful farm and a great guy, Brent, two trackers. How do you get one? Yeah, you hire us. That's great. Anyways, they come, panels come on a, a pallet and the frame gets built um, on a jig here. It's picked up with a skid steer. The mast gets assembled. You pick it up with a Teleboom and hang it on the can, blah, blah, blah. It's uh, the base is concrete now with a steel riser. The concrete's been retired. Now we have a steel riser. Then we have them made at American Concrete in Lewiston. They come and set them with the machine that sets catch basins. And uh, I take all the pictures so it looks like Sean does all the work. That's it. They shed snow. They make more electricity because they follow the sun. You can really put one up in two days. It's cool, they're reliable. The trackers are guaranteed for 10 years. We really haven't had many service problems. I've been around putting up almost 100 now. Um, it'll save you money on your electric bills. It's a great way to show that you're on the move and making things happen. So I'm ready to take questions and Don and I can both take questions at this point. How's that, Renee? Yeah, awesome, thanks guys. There's that, there's that huge field in Vermont and uh, for someone being there, so I'll just, the last thing I'll say is uh, they all move six inches every eight minutes. And uh, that's a pretty creepy thing when there's 366 of them. <laughs> so Don's here for questions and I'll stop the uh, share of my slideshow. Uh, my mouse is not happening. Let me try escaping. Ooh, do I have a mouse yet? I do, stop share and we're all back. Yeah, we're a small group, so I'd say people just feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions as they come up for you. Wow. Everybody was just so stunned by our presentation in my funny solar house here. Anybody have questions about money? Because that's usually the second question yeah. I ask somebody. Yeah. I play devil's advocate at most uh, site visits. These people are like, oh, well, they want to do solar. And then I go, do you have any money? <laughs> that's terrible. Because <laughs> it's not cheap, but it's cheap in the long run. And yeah. we don't have any more time, is my answer. Right. We have to transition. And sure. I mean, can you tell us just if there's what sorts of 
current incentives there might be out there if people are looking for if there's any financial and you mentioned tax tax yeah, credits a, for your own federal setup. tax credit on the total cost of the project so we submit an invoice and your tax person has to mess with that and that it's 26 percent if the system is commissioned by the end of the year or mostly installed next year it goes to 22 percent so that's a federal tax credit if you have that sort of nut to deal with. Yeah, um, generally uh, that big array that I showed everybody that was charging my car, um, I did that install um, and including the two storage cans, the concrete, the digging the trench, putting in the wire, dropping the pole, uh, it was about $16,000. So a shade under $2 a lot, but I also got a shop into secure storage areas. So it was, uh, it was well worth it to me. Um, you can enter solar at very low cost though. And so I did bring some audio visual aids because nowadays there are all, all these old panels that are kicking around. You can find them on eBay, Uncle Henry's. Uh, this was an experimental one that I had for a couple of decades. It was made in the eighties, it's still working. And it runs my radio out in my shop just for fun. But you can take this or some similar panel and plug it into this, which is a booster pack that you know most guys that are handy would have one in their shop somewhere to jumpstart your dead car. This has a little charge controller in it. It's got a little battery. And you can actually hook these up to a bigger battery and store even more electricity. And then you can just plug a little pocket inverter into the hole there and then 12 run, volts and run your yeah, 12, run anything USB. Yeah, run the USB stuff and uh, and put a little inverter on, run run you know low wattage um, AC stuff too. So that's pretty that's a pretty low entry level. Uh, under a hundred bucks you can <laughs> you can get a system. So I've been trying to get people to start somewhere and this is a start. And you can add on and keep going that's what I started very small and uh, in fact uh, Mike Mike Newsom you have a, a child and uh, I do yeah and during COVID time here Alyssa's uh, a daughter Aislinn and and Duncan came because of COVID and I gave them each a battery a goal zero battery and that's where they could plug their computer in so you could do that with your daughter is she would have to find a way to have a small solar panel and in order to use her phone or any of her devices. And Aislinn really got into it. And on sunny days, we would go and plug it into a single panel I have on the front lawn and that was her power source. And then we started doing all DC lighting in the house here for blackouts and just got them aware of it. And it was, you know, hands on like that, that I think really changed them is that it wasn't this odd thing about you know, their phone and their device and their computer. They're so used to just taking power wherever they are. And now here's this finite thing, this battery, which showed, hey, it's half full. I better plug it in today. Yeah, or uh, <laughs> bicycle powered generators. And, um, yeah, you have to go out and bicycle before yeah, you can make, use your make, phone. Make, get a little <laughs> exercise, make up that 100 watts per hour. Yeah. So. Talking about generators, the uh, system you put in here, what I really like is the fact that we've got backup power when the grid goes down. Yeah, that was a Ted and Doretta system is on their barn and it was a solar edge system with one inverter that dealt with uh, store edge is what they call it with a huge LG battery. And then the other inverter did half the other rest of the array. But um, so you haven't had any power outages per se then Ted, right? Well, we've had well, but we've, so we've had a few we've had power outages, but you haven't. We've had right, exactly. Yeah, the refrigerators have all run. Nothing was leaking out. It it worked. It um, worked. It, uh, actually, only one refrigerator worked, which is the one that Greta uses for baking. The good. others aren't aren't on the critical loads panel. So ah, right. But it works. It's great. Cool. Zach, mm -hmm. do you have any questions for Don and I? Zach Bell, I'm looking at you. No, okay. You thinking of doing solar? Now I feel like I'm at the sales pitch side of things. Hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, you, you, there you go. You unmuting? Can you hear me? 
Okay. I've heard that uh, the price of the panels has gotten so cheap that a lot of people don't worry about the trackers anymore. They just throw more panels on their roof. Can you comment on that? Panels have gotten cheaper and panels have gotten more dense. It depends. You can either go, the tracker adage was less panels that are really dense instead of a lot of panels on your roof. Uh, I don't like climbing on your roof that much anymore, but it's certainly, you know, you have to juggle all those parts for sure. People that have a great roof and have a lot of room could overload it with panels and then you have to deal with a bigger inverter and then time of installation. So a tracker can really be put up in two days because we're using 72 cell panels on an L20. Uh, only putting up 20 panels is really pretty quick. And for the output that you get, which is at least 35 to 40% more, it's a machine. It can possibly break. Uh, it takes up a really small footprint. If you have acreage and land, ground mounts, pole mounts, or trackers. If you have a roof, go with that. Yeah. The thing that, that works uh, with the trackers, so they need a big sky view. So your you know, sun comes up over here and in the summertime, way over here. So they, they need a, a big sky view. Uh, and when you have a fixed array, beyond about 10 and 2, uh, solar 10 and 2, you're, you're not getting that much electricity. So if you have obstructions to the sunlight uh, outside of there, it's not going to affect your total amount that much. In the winter time, if you're off grid, um, that, you know, the sun comes, the sun <laughs> comes up here, it goes down over there. So, so, you know, if you had a tracker, it's going to do this. So what, you know, it's the summertime and the net energy billing where you can get all of that huge amount of sunshine and you store it in, in the grid, basically, um, which is the world's biggest battery. And it's really a good deal if you have access to all that. I was off grid for a long time. And when we got the electric car, I found it was pretty difficult to charge the car at night. I don't know why. <laughs> more batteries, more money on batteries. Yeah. Any other questions? Fred, what's happening with the sort of commercial market? Like when we were, how long has our system been up? Is it, is it four or five years or something? And, Go ahead. you know, uh, financially it was a little bit of a push. Um, but so if the, you know, cost of electricity with CMP hasn't gotten any cheaper since then, but the, but the installation cost I assume is lower than it was. Uh, installation cost is lower, yep. Per watt. Right, per watt, right. So, so why isn't, you know, I mean, why isn't every business doing what we did five years ago, which is calling you at Thanksgiving and saying, hey, we've got some, we've got some money burning a hole in our pocket. Can you do something for us so we can get it, you know, get some of the fixed cost here on this year's corporate tax return? Like, there's a big field going across from the airport right near Sean Kane's uh, mom's house, right? Um, yeah. That's a, that's a production company from Connecticut. They've sort of moved offices into Poland. That's 30 acres they're putting up. Uh, we've talked to them a little bit and they weren't interested in hiring us. They're bringing in their own help. Uh, he's expecting to do 10 different huge solar farms like that. And I don't know how they plan to offload it to CMP. Yeah. Um, Rusty oh. Partridge today, when he was putting up a timber frame said, <laughs> hi. You want to talk about your black cat, you're solarized. Um, he was talking about getting a, a flyer in the mail um, from one of these companies that are putting up the solar farms, offering him 10 or 15% off his electric bill. That was it. So I don't know how all this is going to be offloaded. Things are certainly getting built. Um, and Mike will be talking tomorrow about the solar farm that's a possibility here in Norway and South Paris. And some of the problems that we've been having <laughs> trying to get the one started at the old Norway landfill. So it's a good question. Hope you're silent now. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if you have the capital, like, to just, and the land and the view, you should just be putting your own in and not, like, sort of waiting for one of these solar, solar farms, farms to happen. Or, or something like that, right? Yeah, we, I, I'm with you completely. You shouldn't okay. be waiting. And we just took a, a job with uh, Edward Jones down in uh, Kittery, actually in Elliott, Maine, and he put in a solar tracker on the property he owns. 
uh, and on the roof of his business. And part of it's going to be split just like you did with your sister is the nut that he makes is going to be sent to his house and then the rest for the business. We just took a job right now with three trackers going up for a heat pump company in Durham, Maine that realizes they want to do it. So I think there's more and more realization that now's the time. Um, and the tax incentive is a big deal as we get on towards the yeah, end of the year. Right. I, yeah, I just wish everybody would do it. Not because I like being busy, I'm getting a little tired of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yet another tracker. Well, you know, this solar power is pretty reliable, even though the sun is, is a little bit iffy here in, in Maine. Um, the systems work, and I've I've gone from a small system to now what I would call a medium-sized system, and they're reliable. They last a long time. There's there's quite a lot of talk about end of end of life issues with solar panels, but um, I have panels that were made back in the 80s that are still working. They aren't working as well as they were when they were brand new, but they're still working. That's 40 years old. Uh, I have some hawk sand panels that are that old. And so um, there, there can be issues, um, but I mean, it's, it's, it's great. And if whatever you make for yourself is something that you don't have to get from somebody else, it provides me with a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, okay. and, and Mike also came up. Oh, Carol, you want to say something? Well, just picking up on the end of life. Uh, I'm getting old and tired. Yeah. And not really interested in maintaining anything else because I already have geothermal. Yep. Um, and not a lot of land that isn't like already, in, you know, sort of devoted to cows from my brother. Um, so I was really, what is the sort of maintenance responsibility? Uh, a roof mount, you need to keep the squirrels and critters from getting under it. If you put it near a tree where leaves can come off and get under the array, but not much on a roof because it's away from everything. The inverters tend to get tired after 10 or 12 years of heating up and cooling and heating up and cooling. But the panels are guaranteed for 25. Uh, a solar tracker is guaranteed, the actual machine itself is guaranteed for 10. Um, again, the panels all come now with this rating of 25 years. And we haven't had really many maintenance issues with the trackers. Uh, every now and then one will do its thing and you know you have to replace a, a valve in it. Uh, Sean and I and once you get into solar the thing that happens with everybody is this is everybody wants to monitor their solar. So I just looked at Mike Newsom's and uh, I can see that it was installed in 2016 and he's been going for five years. Sean and I look at these once a week at all our systems and a red flag will come up if something isn't working. So it doesn't have to be on you Carol to know how your system's doing if you don't want to check it once a week. When people first start, this screen thing becomes somewhat addictive is how much did I make today? Um, I know that Ted and Doretta have been checking, you know, and, and that kind of goes away in a year, in a couple of years, and you know that your bill is being covered. Um, so this whole data part of it and us actually looking in at the system because there, most of them are connected out to the internet. Uh, and some of them are getting smart enough, like the Tesla gets updates to the car, and we can actually send updates to your inverter at your house and and see what's up if something starts to mess. I get way too many updates. Yeah, <laughs> way, oh, tough stuff, yeah. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, right. When I, when I first started doing, <laughs> doing the solar in a more serious way. I'm subscribing. <laughs> yeah. Um, How do you um, know if your property is solar okay? Uh, we come out and do a site visit or we look on Google Earth and sort of do a flyover. Uh, there's a couple devices um, that can measure the viability of your site and you can then decide, oh, this site's 65% viable because there's too many trees on it. And you can ask Ted and Doretta if they were going to cut down their trees. And yes, they did. So their production. <laughs> yeah. So yes, you do have to make some commitments and then a lot of customers tell me all the time, oh, we're going to cut that down. And most people install the solar and then they start cutting things down because they can see the shading. Um, sure. That's so, yeah, there's a device, um, a pathfinder it's called, we can come and get up on your roof and actually hold it and take a picture of this dome that's on top of it. And it shows the shading for a full year. Oh, wow. 
Uh, so that's what, that's what I really should be done, is to have somebody come and look. Yeah, site so, visits important. Yeah. But this, the simple way for simple souls like me are, you know, face south, solar south, high noon. There's no obstructions from 10 to 2. You have a reasonable site. A window. So. Sort of hey, Don. <laughs> yeah. So uh, last night, Travis did EV 101. And uh, my question for you is, when are you going to uh, retire your uh, leaf and take the batteries out of it and use it as a home, convert it to like a home storage system? Yeah. Because that Travis was saying, you know, when they're 70% viable, you know, you lose, you've only got 70% of your range, but the, the batteries from older EVs are be, can, keep being converted to, you know, other uses as exactly. opposed to sort of being recycled per se. And right. I had never heard about that. And oh, I immediately cool. thought of you. I was like, oh, Don's going to do that. It, it's a massive battery. Even at half its capacity, right. it's still huge. It just isn't as practical for rolling a huge battery down the road at high speed. So... Um, in the UK, they actually already have the system available. Uh, Nissan has a, a car battery to house transition system, but it's and not available here. It's so not, yeah, uh, Yellowstone National Park has been taking LEAF batteries per se and hooking them up and using them for solar storage. So there are applications that are happening, Mike. And there's a company that Tony Giambro and I and John Cates are contacting to try and take uh, my leaf, which was the first one sold in Maine, and I have degradation in my battery. The company in New Zealand is offering a software update and new cables. So I'm going to take my 2012 leaf battery and give it to Tony and John so they can take the cells out of it that are viable and rebuild Scott's battery that was ZZ's leaf. It gets complicated. And I am taking a battery out of a car that got crushed by a tree and has a, a, a battery that is a hundred percent and will probably push me up to a regular range. So we're waiting for this company in New Zealand to send us the software kit and a couple cables to take a 2013 battery and stick it in a 2012 leaf. But the biggest thing that will happen in the next couple years is V to G is what you're talking about is vehicle to grid or vehicle to your house. And in Japan, Nissan opened this up with most of their cars, they guess they didn't trust us as Americans, is that there is actually a plug in the leaf that if your house went down, you could go out and plug an extension cord into your car. And that will become more and more popular in the future is in, in the Tesla, I'm driving around a 100 kilowatt battery. Um, you know, in the Tesla power wall that I'm getting is only going to be 14 kilowatts. Why wouldn't I use my Tesla in a power outage, uh, you know, for a couple of days and then drain my battery in my car and then I wouldn't be able to drive anywhere which is probably good. Um, so this vehicle to grid thing is happening and there's one company, and Sean's waiting on this, there's one company in Quebec right now that's designing an inverter that will plug into your car and the inverter will be the link. So the inverter just won't be doing solar off your roof, it would also talk to your car's energy and be able to put that into your house. So things like that are happening, they're happening slowly. You know, Tesla has never really talked about V2G but other car companies are considering it. Because if you buy an electric car, you're absolutely right. Even if this battery has gone down to 70%, it's still extremely useful. So we're tinkering on it. Paris Auto Barn's putting their hats on. I talked to Barry in New Zealand. My phone call to him for five minutes was $42, but I got him to try and send this darn kit. Um, so, you know, we're all kind of out here experimenting with what to do with these things as we adopt. Oh, you're purring. Thanks. <laughs> That's Anybody awesome, else? guys. Yeah, any other lingering questions? So a practical question. I might be building a barn and the roof would uh, support panels. What would be the optimal pitch of your roof if you were designing it specifically for solar in Maine. Yeah, an actual 12-12 would be the best. It's harder for us to get to put the panels up, but it would shed. Yes, that's what mine is. It's 12 -12. a 12-12 pitch. And it's just about um, 
where we are in the um, latitude as well. So uh, perpendicular to the sun twice a year, pretty much. And, um, you know, in the winter, of course, lower and less and some are higher, but it's a good compromise. You can um, drop them down to maybe 38 um, degrees and still get snow sliding off of them pretty well. Um, I oriented my panels in uh, portrait mode so that the snow would slide more easily when they're in landscape. Um, all the little ridges between the panels tend to hold the snow. Um, my panels, even uh, in the worst weather when we have freezing rain, I don't think I've ever seen snow cover them for more than two days. And, and usually even in a day that if there's enough sunshine that's shining through the snow, it warms it up enough and, us, and the snow comes off. It can come off in a hurry. You don't want to be standing in under it when it decides to do that. Um, yeah, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of snow sometimes, but yeah, it works. Um, that's, that's what I did and it, it's working. Did, uh, Ted and Doretta, did you find the, the shed flying off the barn in the spring this year? Oh yeah, actually we didn't hold too much snow, but maybe not because uh, global warming and so forth, but there were, there were several days where we had a good snow cover and the power went down. But then again, that's, those aren't the, the primary heat, or solar days. No, it's, it's yeah, December and January and February. Um, and that's the one thing once people start getting data is you say, look, it's an average, it's an, it's an average. Mm -hmm. uh, the solar trackers, I never mentioned actually have an anemometer on them and if it's too windy, they'll go to flat. And on those crisp winter days where it's windy out, I would always be crying, oh, this thing's flat, I'm not making anything because the sun is so low, but it's all an average. So if your array is, is uh, full of snow, um, you can get a snow rake out and try yeah. not to don't whack the panels. I used to do that. the lower edge. Yeah, when it was <laughs> new and, and uh, kind of the honeymoon period, I would be up there on my roof and scraping snow off and sweeping. When I was off grid, that was more important. And uh, the house actually still is off grid. Um, and so in the wintertime, when I get the snow on, I'd go up there and risk my life to, to sweep <laughs> snow off the panels. the panels. But they were clean then. This summer, actually, it's been so dry and that, dusty that there's a significant amount of dust on my panels. It's the first year that this has happened. Wow, yeah. so, we and found that with, with the snow rake is if we, we rake just the bottom foot or so of the panel yeah, we're really and sick. below it, and that would get a little bit of heat going and it would make it slide easier. Yeah. Good. Okay. Tips by Ted and Doretta how to clear your pants. Well, he's the one that did it. I just kept saying, hey, <laughs> hey we're not generating any power much. Today. Get out there. Uh, actually, this funny little ground mount I put out there in my COVID mount, uh, I went and washed the panels early one morning because the question came up this summer a bunch when we had eight weeks of no rain. Mm. Hey, can I clean my panels? Fred and Sean, can I clean my panels? Yeah, well, don't do it in the middle of the day when they're about 10,000 degrees and you get your hose out. Uh, <laughs> Thermal yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you but uh, yeah, out west and in Arizona and other places, they're actually building a bunch of robots for some of these big solar farms and ground mounts because they're realizing that this dust and the covering on the panel itself, they're losing so much um, power because the panels are dirty. So they're starting to figure a way there'll be some innovation. Mm. Yeah, it's called rain. Yeah, that's a <laughs> Yeah, in Maine, it rains every other week. And, uh, it's supposed this to, year. not this year. No. Uh. Well, anyways, thanks for hanging in there, folks. I love looking at Carol Rice's um, uh, microwave. That's good. <laughs> Hi, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have any other questions, obviously, you know, Mike has solar, Ted and Doretta have solar, uh, Scott has solar, and, you know, it's, it's not that much of a mystery anymore, really. Mm -hmm. um, did we take any questions? Anybody leave us a note? No? We're looking good. Yeah. I mean, hopefully. Just, a, Renee, Renee has just one last. Information. <laughs> Somebody's right. got a last question. Who's that? Yeah, just one last little question. So I, I remember this computer's microphone is broken, which is why I couldn't ask earlier. But um, oh, in terms of being like a renter and not having a place where uh, one could install panels, could, I was really interested to hear, like, you can do a thing where you have a battery and a panel and do something where you kind of do something. 
Well, yeah, there's been solar farms and there's one up on uh, Paris Hill and you had to buy into it. Most of the folks lived in Portland. They lived in apartments or didn't own their own homes. And once you're in CMP's jurisdiction, your power can be made anywhere. My power is made a mile from my house, except for this thing I put on my front lawn. But you, as a person that is interested in solar electricity, can, uh, Renee, are there other places that CB would know about or Mike Dunn would know? that there's efficiency main, where there's other ways to actually have just on your CMP bill, you can ask for renewable energy. Yeah. Or you can find a way to join a solar farm with all these new ones that are going up. You could be our research person to find out how to dig it out of them. Instead of just 10 or 15%, you should be able to ask these solar farm companies how you can pony up. The one that went up on Paris Hill, they were asking that you put in a third of the amount money-wise, and then over seven years, you had to pay off the 20 panels that you kind of bought. There was one meter on the site for the 200 panels, and then it was divvied up between the host and the eight other people. And now solar farms have gone, now that LePage is gone, it's gone from a host to 200 people can be part of a solar farm. So Mike Dunn's talk tomorrow might give you more information. Yeah, um, yeah, about how to deal with that situation. And it was funny that this one solar farm right in our backyard on Paris Hill, that the host lived there, and then the eight other people all lived in Portland. Oh, wow. That bought into the system. That was one of our vision energies first, and then they kind of got out of the business because just putting eight customers together with only 200 panels wasn't that viable for them. And now they've come back and are building much bigger solar farms, and there are, they're sort of spreading throughout the state of Maine. There's kind of a run yeah. on solar farms. There are economies of scale, scale with those things, but it still leaves you dependent upon the grid. So, you, you know, unless you have a battery in your house and an inverter and a couple of solar panels out in the yard that you can take with you when you go. Um, well, that's, I, you know, there's like, there's, a, there's an electric car at the house and there's, and, and we have a goal zero battery, but right. one of those little ones, but I'm curious, like the cost of like bigger, because, you know, just like how do batteries work in terms of like a bigger, like, can you get a bunch of goal zero batteries? And, like, yeah, Goal Zero is actually starting to build uh, systems where you would have a critical loads panel in your house. I don't know how you do that in an apartment, but they're starting to stage batteries. Or we could build you a battery trailer with the extension cord you'd run up to the window. Um, yeah. And we built a couple of those that had two panels and then a bunch of batteries that we kind of farmed out at some of the trade shows and the food festival where you could run things. Like kind of a mobile, yeah. Yeah, molar, a mobile solar uh, device. You know, I have a golf cart that has solar panels on the top of it, and I wrote it off of my taxes as a mobile solar charging device. And when power went out in the winter, I'd go to put an extension cord to it. Cool. But Goal Zero is starting to build other things, and there's other battery companies. And you want to make sure it's portable, and it's not all that easy to just plug into your apartment. Yeah, unless you well, we're at a house, though, too. So it's sort of, it's a house setup. It's just not one that... You know, it's just sort of the, you don't have 15 years to make it back. Um, right. Because what if you move in five years or something? Yeah. You're better off probably with the community solar project. That yeah. You can take your ownership with you when you go. Yeah. Or you sell it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these offerings that are out right now are not about you gaining any equity. Just like buying electricity from CMP right now, you never gain any equity in the generation uh, of the electricity. But... Uh, Revision has done a different model. I don't know what their model is now. Um, CB, we're, we are trying to get one off the ground, and uh, but um, I don't want to steal my... Yeah, tune in tomorrow there. night. Yeah. So. Scott's going to log in here and say something about it, maybe. Looks like Can't he's getting us. ready to go home. <laughs> it's, it's cool. I, you know, I just walked back into the room here, Fred. I had to run out for a minute. I'm going to say something about what? Or no. Uh, um, Zachary Bell, and you're not Zachary. What's your first No, no, name? I'm Cynthia Davies. Cynthia. Cynthia was asking about solar farms, and she has an apartment, and how would you do a battery in her case, or how would you get some equity into solar? And we suggested she call back tomorrow night and watch CB with Mike Dunn about yeah. community solar. And I'm curious, too, as to how you actually – uh, join a solar farm and that revision did it years ago and I gave her the example is that you could buy in a third or uh, then in seven years it was almost like a small co-op and then you own a piece of the action. 
Well, that's something that CB is definitely striving for is to develop a cooperative model of community solar where people can build in equity as opposed to just buy, buy their power at, a pro, at the same, at a slightly reduced rate from what the general offer is, standard offer. Yep. And you know, you could do that for 20 years and you'd never own anything, but um, we're hoping to come up with a model. And it'll be interesting to talk tomorrow night because we have um, different um, providers there to talk about their different models. But that's a goal for us is to create like a sort of cooperative model. So Renee and Cynthia, I think it's tomorrow night at seven again. Yes. If you want to jump in. Great. Scott sort well, of looks like a policeman tonight. I just thought I mentioned that. I don't know if he's been out working in the streets of Norway there. <laughs> Edge here. Solar, solar police. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks guys. And thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I will send a follow-up email that has the recording if anybody wants to catch it again. Um, but yeah, otherwise we'll let you go. Thanks for hosting, Renee. Yeah, thank you. And thanks, Scott, for getting us to do this. And yeah. Ted and Doretta and Mike and people that have done solar. And, and Carol, we got to look at your microwave for a while. Thanks for asking good questions. And if you have any other questions in the future, don't uh, be afraid to reach out. Happy to talk about solar. All right.